and a further 11 with either, the, either of the two ha uh, handwritten initials, look 2664 and 2665. And here's another drawing that Otley thought, in this case wrongly, was by Tishner, it's in fact by his close associate, Domenico Campagnola. I have been unable to divine any pattern as to when Otley marked his ownership of his drawings. However, the absence of a mark is one shared with a number of other British drawing collectors of the period, such as the portrait painter George Napton or the merchant George Hibbert, whose collections, like that of Otley, can only be pieced together, laboriously going through the auction sale catalogues of their collections to see if the descriptions are sufficiently detailed to identify the drawings, or if the name of the buyer is known to keep track of them through their subsequent history. It should be remembered that the stamping of drawings in Otley's day was customarily done after the collector's death by his executor to boost its collective value and to record it for posterity before it was scattered at auction. As we have seen, Otley only occasionally stamped his drawings and the posthumous stamping did not occur as he sold his collection for the enormous sum of £10,000 in the early 1820s to the painter Sir Thomas Lawrence. The latter's drawing collection, numbering 4,000 drawings and around seven albums, including two by Fra Bartolomeo now in Rotterdam, was unquestionably the best collection in qualitative terms ever assembled in Britain and arguably, as concerns Italian drawings, unparalleled before or since in any country. An assessment of how large a share of Lawrence's collection once belonged to Otley can never be known. However, if the British Museum's collection is any guide, around a third of the drawings with Lawrence's collector's mark are traceable, with varying degrees of certainty, to Otley. The two sure signs of Otley's ownership is either a reproduction of the work in his selection from the highlights of his collection, the Italian School of Drawings, a publication issued in parts between 1808 and 1823, uh, which we will return to later. Or, as John Gear first noted, the drawing's presentation on a distinctive mount. This consists of a thin, cream-colored paper with paired ruled red li ink lines and one black, black one, and with the name of the artist neatly written in black ink. So here's a rather nice example of a uh, complete Otley mount by Carabino Alberti, and you see the name of the artist written at the bottom. That's often chopped off, it has to be said in the British Museum. Here's another example. Now, if, you don't, if you've never heard of the artist Donato Mascani, don't beat yourself up, because I've never have either. Um, <laughs> The, the stripped-down decoration of the mount is markedly different from the elaborate ruled and wash ink line borders and gold fillets of traditional English mounts, a change that is symptomatic of Otley's allegiance to a neoclassical aesthetic that favoured simplicity over embellishment. And so on the right is a marvellous drawing by Becca Fumi uh, with a Richardson-style uh, uh, Richardson mount. The, a, a more traditional um, English type of mount. Otley, born in Dunstan Park in, in Berkshire in 1771, had the means to collect because of the wealth that flowed from his family's extensive West Indian sugar plantations. The Otley family, originally from Yorkshire in the north of England, had estates across the West Indies, including St Vincent, where William's father, Richard Otley, was born in 1730. William's mother, Sarah Elizabeth Young, came from a similar background as her father, Sir William Young, had been born in Antigua and had served as Lieutenant Governor of San Dominica and later Tobago. And this is the Young family. She features uh, in Zoffany's group portrait of the Young family, now in the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool, painted shortly before her marriage to Richard Otley in 1770. And there she is indicated by an arrow. The source of the Young's family prosperity is alluded to by the presence of a young African servant at the left. William, whose name Young Otley, brought together these two slave-oving dynasties, had no choice in his parentage, but in adulthood he distanced himself from this inheritance. The anonymous author of Otley's obituary in the 1837 annual biography and obituary 
quoted a letter from William to his mother giving up his rights to a share of the proceeds of a sale of an estate in Tobago. Open quotation. The slaves or the money derived from them the sale of them is to me no attraction. End of quote. This moral stand had the practical consequence that he had to support himself, his means of doing so stemming from his knowledge and enthusiasm for the arts. That knowledge and enthusiasm had been nourished from childhood as his uncle, Sir William Young, second baronet, had travelled in France and Italy on the Grand Tour in the early 1770s, including a trip in the company of the noted collector of antiquities, Charles Townley, accompanied by the Edinburgh-born draftsman John Brown. Their southern Mediterranean tour in 1772 was documented, documented by Young in watercolour sketches and in his journal published in 1774. William Young Otley learned to draw while at school, first in Richmond and Yorkshire, and after a brief period of study at Winchester, he continued his artistic training in 1787 at the Royal Academy Schools, briefly under the tuition of his uncle, old travelling companion, John Brown. Otley brought, bought 200 of Brown's drawings following his death in 1787, and it was probably through Brown that he met the Swiss artist Johann Heinrich Fusli, as the two had been in Rome together in the 1770s. Otley, in turn, befriended the Swiss artist, the two of them sharing a passion for the monumental physicality of Michelangelo's art. And here is a, an early drawing by Fusli done in Rome, copying a Michelangelo. Fusli's interpretation of the Florentines Sculptor's Manor, and here's a, a, a mature example of uh, Fusli's drawing from the BM, deeply affected Otley's own quixotic style. So here are two drawings by um, William Young Otley, um, and the one on the right, he went on to turn it into an etching. Now on the screen. Otley was never more than a gifted amateur draftsman, but his artistic training at the Royal Academy Schools that continued until 1791 was crucial to his f formation as a connoisseur, since it meant, meant he had a thorough understanding of the practical function of drawing. It is no surprise, therefore, that as a collector he appreciated the insights that working drawings can provide in showing the unfolding thoughts of an artist, even those that sketch preliminary ideas might not be immediately aesthetically appealing. The best example of this are the four leaves from a small-scale sketchbook he owned now in the Ashmolean Museum of Oxford that, op that Michelangelo filled with hastily drawn studies for the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Um, and so here's an example, and there on the, on the right-hand side you see uh, the figure in the lunette to which the, the drawing on the left is, is related. And uh, another one from that sketchbook, uh, and the facsimile from the Italian uh, School of Design. And in fact, the, the, the Ashmolean drawing is a bit faded, so actually one can read it better in the facsimile uh, than one can actually by looking at the original. And there we can see the Michelangelo study for God the Father separating light from darkness, which is studied here and here. But um, connoisseurs and, and drawings experts of, of successive ages really struggled uh, with the attribution uh, of, of, to Michelangelo of this work. And, and Bernard Berenson was one of those that could not believe that the sublime Michelangelo could ever produce such unprepossessing drawings, an aesthetic judgment that overlooks the improbability of anyone but the solitary artist making studies for such a major work. And in, you know, now they are fully accepted uh, as works by Michelangelo. So Otley's artistic training means he belongs to the long-established British tradition of artist, artist drawing collectors, one that stretches back to Sir Peter Lely in the 17th century and continued with Sir Thomas Lawrence in Otley's time. But this artistic sensibility in Otley was matched by a scholarly cast of mind that drove him to delve deeply into the origins of drawing and printmaking with a rigour and intelligence that sets him apart from any British collector before him. After leaving the Brit uh, Royal Academy in 1791, the 20 
year-old Otley left England for Italy, where he remained until 1799. It was thanks to this extended study of Italian art that Otley gained his formidable reputation as the foremost authority in the field, an authority demonstrated by the remarkable quality of the collections he amassed in Italy of old master drawings, prints, paintings, and manuscript illuminations. Otley's timing was fortuitous as the French army's invasion of Italy under Napoleon in 1796 resulted in the dispersal of historic Italian collections as their owners face an unenviable choice between sale at a reduced price to opportunistic foreigners or holding on to their artworks and risking them being looted by the French. Otley's journey to Italy was one that a number of British drawings collectors had made before him, such as the painter Jonathan Richardson the Younger, who went there as part of his grand tour of 1716-1720, Joshua Reynolds in the early 1750s, but what was exceptional was the eight-year duration of his stay and the means to explore and research his wide-ranging passion for Italian art as he pleased. He wasn't an artist, really, so it didn't mean he had to earn his living by, uh, by painting or by sculpting. He was free to, to study as he, as he wished. These factors, allied to a quickness of mind and a gift for historical research, meant that Otley amassed an unrivaled wide-ranging knowledge of Italian art. To take just one example of his clearly formidable visual memory is his spotting of a, of a lot after he'd returned to England in 1811 at the sale of the second Earl Spencer, which was described in the catalogue as Gentile Bellini, open quotation, a scripture or saint subject of many figures. Otley recognised this as a preliminary, preliminary idea by Bellini's brother-in-law, Andrea Mantegna, for a fresco in the Ovatari Chapel in Padua, as it as it, as it turns up three years later in one of Otley's periodic sales of his drawing collection described as one, a saint subject of many figures, free pen, an early performance painted in the Church of the Eremitani at Padua. And it remains the only known study of Mantegna's first fresco cycle. From the Mantegna drawing, it seems highly likely that Otley went to Padua uh, in northern Italy, and he's known to have been in Bologna uh, not so far away in 1792. But we cannot know that for sure, as no diaries for his Italian years are known. In one instance, a rare lapse, namely attributing a copy after Piero della Francesca's Dream of Constantine in Arezzo to the Venetian painter Giorgione, provides good grounds for thinking he never visited the city, or at least uh, not San Francesco where Piero's frescoes are found. And so on the right is this... Uh, extraordinarily high-quality facsimile um, prints that are found in the uh, School of Design. And although I'm sure you don't need reminding, that is what uh, Piero's fresco actually looks like. But it is a salutary reminder of the fact that he didn't know it was by Piero, uh, of the obscurity in Otley's time of, of Piero, an artist that we now think of as one of the quintessential figures of the Renaissance. Otley can, however, claim credit for introducing another artist of the same calibre to a British audience, as he was the first owner of works by the then obscure Florentine painter Sandro Botticelli. One of the paintings he brought back from Italy was his numinous mystic nativity, now in the National Gallery in London. And he also unwittingly acquired some of Botticelli's very rare drawings in the shape of three tempera on linen studies for an adoration of the Magi, now in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge and the Pierpont Morgan Library, which Otley believed were actually by a slightly earlier art, uh, Florentine artist, Fra Filippo Lippi. Otley's travels in Italy are now better known thanks to Hugh Brigstock's recent study of the drawn copies he made of works of art, so that we know now, so that we know, know that he, from his base in Rome, he spent time in Assisi, Florence, Orvieto, Perugia, and Pisa. The activity of copying works of art for record purposes, as well as a means of analysing their qualities, would have been a standard part of Art Otley's artistic training, and it was clearly something he excelled at. 